very warm welcome as we join together this morning and uh, we want to come to praise the Lord Jesus to lift up his name and great to have you with us as we do that together. We're looking this morning at how we can trust God or depend upon God and to help us some words from Psalm 28. The Lord protects and defends me. I trust in him. He gives me help and makes me glad. I praise him with joyful songs. The Lord protects his people. He defends and saves his chosen king. That was the, the psalmist David as he looked to God, even as the king of Israel. And we ourselves, we can take up that same faith of looking to God and trusting in him. Thy God with all thy heart, 
with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Amen. And the prayer for this period of Easter as we continue. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, have overcome death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that as by your grace, going before us, you put into our minds good desires, so by your continual help, we may bring them to good effect. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our reading this morning is taken from the book of uh, 1 Kings, chapter 17, reading from verse 1 to 16. 1 Kings 17, 1 to 16. Elijah and the drought. The prophet named Elijah from Tishba in Gilead said to King Ahab, In the name of the Lord, the living King of Israel, the living God of Israel, whom I serve, I tell you that there will be no dew or rain for the next two or three years until I say so. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Leave this place and go east, and hide yourself near the brook of Cherith, east of the Jordan. The brook will supply you with water to drink, and I have commanded the ravens to bring you food there. Elijah obeyed the Lord's command and went and stayed by the brook of Cherith. He drank water from the brook and Reuben brought him bread and meat every morning and every evening. After a while, the brook dried up because of the lack of rain. Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Then the Lord said to Elijah, Now go to the town of Zarephath, near Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow who lives there to feed you. So Elijah went to Zarephath, and as he came to the gate of the town, he saw a widow gathering firewood. Please bring me a drink of water, he said to her. And as she was going to get it, he called out, and please bring me some bread too. She answered, by the living Lord your God, I swear that I haven't got any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bowl and a drop of olive oil in a jar. I came here to gather some firewood to take back home and prepare what little I have for my son and me, that we will be that will be our last meal, and then we will starve to death. Don't worry, Elijah said to her. Go ahead and prepare your meal. But first, make a small loaf from what you have and bring it to me, and then prepare the rest for you and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. The bowl will not run out of love, or the jar run out of oil, before the day I, I the Lord, send rain. The widows went and did as Elijah said, told her, and all of them had enough food for many days. As the Lord had promised Elijah, through Elijah, the bowl did not run out of love, 
nor did they jar run out of oil. This is the word of the Lord. seeking to take over 
wars and conflicts around the, around the world which continue to increase. Uh, there's the, the problem of the energy crisis, there's problems of uh, the, the cost of living and, and the increasing poverty, and all of the things even on a global scale or on a personal scale, people would, would say they are things are just getting worse and they are spiraling out of control. And is there a God and is he in you know, how can he be in control with all of these things happening? And it's when it's a time like that, it is so important to look at somebody like the life of Elijah. Because the challenges that he faced in his day are very much those similar challenges. Perhaps they came at, at him in a, in a different way, but they were still there. Those superpowers, the, the problems that he was facing. And the way that he could trust in God is the same way that we can also trust and depend upon God. Which is why we're looking at Elijah in, in, this, in a short mini-series in these next few weeks. We'll have breaks in between for, for other things, but uh, we're, we're going to be looking at Elijah. Well, he lived in a time where there were huge challenges, and he, by his trust of God, he could persevere through them. He showed that he could trust in a God who was sovereign, who was over all of their things. Now, Elijah, for, for some, may be a kind of quite distant character. When we say talk of Moses, people would immediately think of, of Moses as, as a prince of Egypt or from, from the different films and accounts of Moses, they would know about Moses. But Elijah, people may not immediately jump to, of, of thinking that I, I know about Elijah. And why even for us to look at, at Elijah? But even in the New Testament, we find that there are many references to Elijah. He, he, this character is somebody who is significant. When Jesus goes up on that mountain where he's transfigured, where he changes in appearance, he goes on the mountain with Peter, James and John, and alongside Jesus there is Moses who is seen and, and engages in a conversation with Jesus, but also is Elijah. Elijah also appears with Jesus. And they both converse, they both have this conversation with Jesus about how he is going to deliver them from, um, or, or, or lead them in, into salvation with, with both of those characters. Moses representing the law and Elijah representing the prophets. So this is an important person that even the New Testament writers pick up on and they refer to him a number of times. Well, he lived in this period of the 9th century before Christ, and this was only 60 years after, after King Solomon. So it wasn't that long a period before those big monarchies of David, of Solomon, and this is only 60 years on after that. But even after Solomon, there is a split in the kingdoms. There is, there is Israel to the north, and Judah to the south. And here, king after king, they are disobedient. They rebel against God. And in, in, at the end of chapter 16, it says this, that Ahab, son of Omri, became king of Israel, and he ruled Samaria. He sinned against the Lord more than any of his predecessors. It wasn't enough to, for him to sin like King Jeroboam, he went further and married Jezebel, the daughter of King Ethbal of Sidon, and worshipped of Baal. He built a temple to Baal in Samaria. He made an altar for him and put it in the temple. He put up an image of the goddess Asherah, and he did more to provoke the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than all of the kings of Israel before him. So one king after another. <laughs> They are just rejecting God. The, the, um, the, the kings of Israel, they were, they were the office holders. They were to be the ones who taught people and allowed them to worship God, who followed the commandments. They were the leaders of God's, God's kingdom. And yet, this is what they were doing. Perhaps 
they were doing something of teaching, teaching the commands, but also they were doing these other things. They were turning their people to worship Baal. And you can imagine all the consequences this would have on their kingdoms, on all their people, when the leaders are doing this. Time after time, generation after generation, these kings are continuing to worsen, to increase in their rebellion against God. Well, what is it that God does? He raises up his prophet, Elijah. Chapter 17, verse 1. A prophet named Elijah from Tishbe in Gilead um, said to King Haya, in the name of the Lord. God doesn't, doesn't raise up, send, uh, oh, can we have the next slide? He, he doesn't send drone attacks. He, he doesn't raise up armies. He set, doesn't um, order missiles to attack. He doesn't even raise up an army uh, of, of his people to go in. He raises up one prophet. He, and this is a huge confrontation of good against evil, of God, the God of Israel against Baal, against this powerful state and institution. And God sends one man. And it says, God armed this one man with the word of God and he sends him into this battle. His name is Elijah, Elijah the Tishbite, and uh, the, the word Elijah, his name is God is, God is, um, my God is Yahweh. Oh, so, so, you know, my God is the God of Israel. So he is one who lives up to his name. And he goes and he boldly declares what God has called him to do. In the name of the living God of Israel, whom I serve, I tell you, there will be no dew nor rain for the next two year or three years until I say so. Now God had promised through Moses that when the people of Israel went, were to, went into the promised land, they were to continue following his commands. They were to continue being obedient to him. But if they didn't, God said through, through Moses in Deut Deuteronomy, that I will hold back the rain and your ground will become too dry for crops to grow. Then you will soon die there. So what God was saying that, that he would cut off the rains, that uh, they would perish if they didn't live in accordance with his commands in, in accordance in, and following him through. So the rains failing, it wasn't global warning or a, or a climate crisis. This was God's judgment on his people because they had turned to other gods. Now the irony is that Baal and Asherah, these gods that they were, they were turning to, that both the king and the people were turning to, they were actually fertility gods. So the people would turn to them to ask for rain on their land, to bring in the harvest. They would turn to them in their prayers to, for um, growth of their crops growth of, of their families, that they would have more children, that these were the fertility gods they would turn to. But God takes the battle right to the de their doorstep, to Baal himself. He says, well, if you are the god of fertility, if you are the one who controls the rains, well, sort it out. I will stop the rains. See what you can do. You stop the rains again. God takes that battle directly to Baal, to that power. Here, this is the judgment of God. The, uh, next slide there. This is, this is the judgment of God. Uh, Elijah is, is told, leave this place, go east, hide yourself near the Cherith Brook, east of the Jordan. The brook will supply you with water to drink and I have commanded ravens to bring you food there. Now, Elijah isn't running away. He isn't on the run because of this fearful of this king. He is the bearer of God's word. And part of God's judgment is silence, is withdrawing his presence from his people. That is part of his judgment. This, this kingdom, his kingdom have been rebellious because of the king and the way he, he's led his people. So God withdraws himself 
from his people. <coughs> so silence in this instance, or Elijah being withdrawn, isn't him going into hiding. It's God withdrawing his, him, himself <coughs> from his people. He is showing his displeasure at, at the way they've turned to idols. It's similar to um, God withdrawing his spirit, a, a Holy Spirit, from King Saul from King Saul because he rebelled against God. It's the same as Jesus speaking to the churches in, in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, saying that I will withdraw your lampstand because you are rebelling, you're not living obediently. God withdrawing his presence because of his displeasure. In Psalm 119, it says, uh, your word is a lamp to, uh, to guide me and a light to my path. And uh, the psalmist also says of putting God's word in his heart so he may not sin. Now, without God's word, it actually means we walk in darkness. We are fumbling around. We fall into sin or we will go the ways of sin. <coughs> without the, the word of God, we are in trouble. It is God's judgment. We for ourselves, we have so many Bibles at our disposal. We have um, many books and commentaries. We can access the, the Bible and hear the Word of God through the radio, through uh, YouTube, through many different means that we have. But still, the Word of God can be distant from us. We can be distant from the way that it's affecting our own lives. People have written different things about it. The Bible is meant to be bread for daily use, not cake for special occasions. Or Charles Colson, uh, he writes this, the family Bible is more often used to adorn coffee tables or press flowers than it is to feed souls and discipline lives. Or somebody else has written, if a Christian is careless in Bible reading, he will care less about Christian living. And the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy and says that in the last days that people will gather around themselves other preachers, preachers who will give a message that they like to hear. They'll have itching ears to listen to sermons that affirm them, that tell them that they're doing nice things even when they're doing sinful things. These are ways that we can withdraw ourselves we can be into that famine of the Word of God. So it's not just a physical famine, it is the famine of the Word of God. And so important to hear like we did last week from that YWAM team, how they take the Word of God to people who need it, who, have, who um, understand, who have that desire for hearing the Word of God. Here there was the drought of rain, but also a drought of the Word of God. There is also a need for the dependence upon God, which is shown by Elijah. Verses 3 and 4, um, he says, Leave this place and go east and hide yourself near Cherith Brook, east of the Jordan. The brook will supply you with water to drink, and I have commanded ravens to bring you food there. Now, why didn't um, God send, being sovereign, send Elijah to, to a neighboring country where there, were nice, there was a nice intercontinental hotel, where there was a nice premier inn for him to stay at. He sends Elijah to a place where he has to be dependent upon God by a brook, by, uh, into a desert basically, in, in a brook where he has to be dependent upon ravens feeding him. And he finds that his needs are met. Two meals daily of meat and bread. It's not quite Deliveroo as uh, the next one. Sorry. It's not quite Deliveroo as uh, um, someone would have, would have expected. Coming on a nice bike and uh, with with all the, all the food all nicely packaged and kept warm. This is Deliver Raven. It's, this is before Uber Eats were set up. God sends um, ravens to come and feed him, just like he kept the people of God in the wilderness with manna and quail, daily how they were fed. Here God keeps Elijah 
dependent upon him day by day. He trusts in God for his next day's meal. God provides for him. Before his prophet can be used, he has to be prepared himself. He has to learn dependence and trust upon God. That's part of the reason God takes him into the wilderness. God allows him to trust in him, to depend upon him. We also, in our modern age, we may have benefits, we may have pensions, we may have savings and wages and so many other means that we depend on um, for our day-to-day -day living. Well, we have to recognise those things come from God. They are all from our sovereign God. They're not just, just that I've worked for this, this is my career, I've, I've done this myself. This is about God who has provided that. Whether it's a small amount or a large amount, it is God who enables us to live in that way. We are to recognise that it comes from Him. And here, even more so, Elijah has to learn that lesson that it is God he has to trust in, he has to be dependent upon. And he does that day by day by this brook. But God doesn't leave him there in that position. While he's uh, having that for this period of time, there is another blow that he faces um, where, where, right where he is. God wants to now move him on because it says in verse 7, after a while the brook dried up because of the lack of rain. God doesn't want to keep us in the same place. He doesn't want to get, let us get comfortable. We might think that that sacrifice of Elijah going into the desert, trusting in God for his daily food in such a way would have been enough. But God calls upon an even greater sacrifice. He says, now you've done that, I want to move you on to another level. I want you to, to do something else for me. God doesn't keep us in a place of comfort, that he doesn't leave us where we are. He moves us on. He calls us to a greater test, a greater stepping out for him. And here he calls his servant to do a, make a greater sacrifice. The brook is dried up to, to, for him to recognise that he still needs to trust God for his, his daily living. And to know that it's not in the circumstances, whether the brook is there or whether the ravens are delivering as they should be, but he has to trust in the character of God not in the circumstances around him. Now that's a very hard lesson for any of us, that we, we depend so much on our circumstances, that we look at our bank balance, we look at um, how, we think about how we are feeling, we think about um, how people, what people say about us, all of those things matter to us so much. But here the lesson is, trust in me. Trust in me as the Sovereign Lord. Trust in me as the one, as the great provider. Trust in me as the one who allows the, the rain for that brook. Trust in me as the one who sends the raven. He is that Sovereign God who is over all of those things. We are to look to Him and not to the gift. We are to look to the giver, the one, the one who has the power. That is the lesson that uh, Elijah is learning more and more. Here, he's not given a forecast. Look, um, I'm planning you this, Elijah, for this next six months you're going to do this, and for the next three years after, the, after that, this is how I'll provide for you. No, there's no guarantee with God in such a way. Day by day obedience, day by day de dependence, even for the prophet of God, even in these testing circumstances, this is what God, God calls him to do. Maybe you've been in a period of stability in a nice job. Perhaps you've been in a period of stability with life at home, in, in a period of stability with various things. Then suddenly there's a hit, perhaps with illness, perhaps with your finances, perhaps with relationships. But that doesn't mean that God has pulled out of your situation. 
God is still there. He is still sovereign over all that is happening. We need to learn that and we need to keep learning that in times of plenty, in times of need, God is still sovereign. Elijah had to learn that for himself. But now this, this dry brook was a signal that God was moving him on. I want you to move on from there. Well, what God moves him on for a better reason for his blessing in verses 8 to 16. God wants to use Elijah in order to show his blessing to others. Now go to Zarephath, the near Sidon, and stay there. I have commanded a widow who lives there to feed you. And as he's directed there in those verses 8 and 9, he obeys and he follows that through. Now he's told that a widow would feed him. Now a, a widow in Old Testament times isn't a wealthy person. A widow, when you read it in the Bible, is, is the person who is in need, like the asylum seeker or um, the, you know, the foreigner, where, where it refers to, look after the widow, look after the poor, look after the, the, uh, the foreigner in your midst. You know, they are the ones who need to be cared for. And yet God says, go to the widow, she is the one who will feed you. And this is no lo little stroll for, for, for um, Elijah from Cherith, where, where the brook is, to, to Zarephath. This is an 85 mile journey and he's got to go, go there. And that is what he's got to look forward to, to another person who is struggling to look to provide for him. And yet he goes, somebody to, to look to this other lady in poverty who would, who would, uh, who would provide for him. And, and so he goes. And not only that, this Zarephath is right in the heart of Baal worship. God is taking Elijah from the area of his promised land into the heartland of Baal worship, into the center of Baal worship. So there is even a harder um, act of dependence. And Elijah takes up that challenge. He goes, he goes as God's word directs him. And as he goes, there is no widow with a table full of, 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 of food laid out for him with lovely accommodation. The picture there is at the gate of the city, he meets a needy widow who herself is asking for help. And she says, by the living Lord your, your God, I swear that I don't have any bread. All I have is a handful of flour in a bowl and a bit of olive in a jar. I came here to gather some firewood to take back home and, and prepare that what little I have for my son and me. And this will be our last meal and we will starve to death. Now could, was God wrong? Was he, did he not realise this, the, the, the state this lady was in, how she needed so much help? But yet, he sends Elijah, who also needs help, to this needy lady who is in that strait of desperation. And we might, we might think that this is, uh, we might judge by, by sight. We might look at uh, the immediate situation uh, and think that, you know, that person can, can, can't help me. You know, that person isn't gifted, that person hasn't got the resources, that person isn't... Um, surely can't be the person that, that God has sent. But yet, time after time, don't we find that? That the person that God uses isn't that fluent, uh, eloquent, that charming, charismatic person. Those aren't the people that God uses. He uses the weak. He uses the, the people who stumble around. He uses people who have difficulties. He uses them, doesn't he? And this is what Elijah has to see as well. That this lady, in her desperation, God wants to use her. People looked at the Lord Jesus and they thought that he can't do anything for, for me. He can't be the saviour. He can't be the messiah. 
He, he, is, he was despised. He came, came from an area which wasn't a place of renown. He, he came from a place and he, he preached a gospel which was very different. And he talked about the cross of suffering, a curse in order to save. Yet yeah, that was a way that God used. God uses the weakness of the world, the foolishness of this age, in order to show his glory. We're not to walk by sight, we're to walk by faith, to walk by the word of God, not to make judgment too quickly that the most gifted is the best person for leading us in a certain way, that the most able is the one that we want. No, God uses the weak because he wants to show his power his greatness through that. And here God is using this lady. But this lady has even an inkling of faith. She says, by the living Lord, your God. She knows that she's not, um, she's not a believer in the God of Israel, but she, she recognizes that there is a God of Israel. She says, by your God, uh, I'll do this. And she follows it through just as Elijah says, go and do this. He says, don't worry or don't fear. Go on and prepare your meal. Make first a small loaf from what you have and bring it to me. Then prepare the rest for you and your son. And even in those desperate circumstances, this lady is willing to listen to the word of God from his prophet. And she follows it through. She goes and cooks him a meal and she does, it, does that first before feeding her son or herself. And she brings it to him just as he had commanded. And what happens is that God provides for her day after day after day. This goes on for months, not just a couple of days, that her, her, the flour and the oil doesn't run out. What a, uh, what a, a wonderful example of faith from this foreign lady and which Jesus even refers to when he teaches Israel, the people of Israel. He refers to this very foreign lady of Seraphim. Look, even Elijah found faith in her, and I don't find faith in that same faith in you. Here, King Ahab and the others, who were in regular hearing of the word of God, they turned their ears away from that. But instead, they should have listened to the word of God, like even this woman was willing to listen to. God can be trusted in the most hard, hardest of circumstances. God can be, his word can be trusted even in the most difficult times that we face. He is the same today. Elijah found that. This widow found that. God's word can be trusted. It gives courage, it gives us encouragement. When we see Elijah, the way that he was willing to trust God, to live up to his namesake, the name that he was given, that he went out to speak to the King Ahab, the courage that he had in that, when he was willing to depend upon God by being going to that brook and uh, trusting the ravens to bring him food. When he went, moved to that foreign land, into that foreign town, into the heart of enemy territory, trembling, I imagine, but knowing that God would keep him, would preserve him. And God keeps his word. He preserves his servant. Elijah was not disappointed. He knew he could trust God who was sovereign, who sent the ravens, who, who would control the brook, who controlled the rains, and we also, we can trust God's prophet, his Messiah, the one who is despised yet went to the cross, the one who is, who is looked down upon, who bore the, course, the, the curse for us, yet he has won the victory. Through all the highs and lows of life, we can trust in him. Maybe there's an uncertainty that you're facing. Maybe there's a circumstance that you are facing, that you think, um, I, I just don't know what's happening. Or perhaps you're looking at some situation with your physical eyes and thinking, how can God even work in this situation? You have to learn from these accounts. 
that God is the same. He is sovereign. We can trust in Him. Even though it may be year after year that we hear of wars. This was, as, as I said, 60 years. And God still allowed rebellion after rebellion going on and on. He only will act in His time when He is given His patience in order that more people can turn to Him. God allows time in order that others would come to Him. Let's not be thrown by our circumstances. Let's not be thrown by what we see around us. But to trust in God, to be dependent upon Him. And we know that in Him we can wholly depend upon. There's uh, an account of uh, a man called George Muller, who you may have heard of from the 19th century. And he was a, a person in, in the West Country, and he had this real passion and desire to help orphans um, at a time of great poverty through Britain. And so him and his wife, they started taking in children. And he, his one kind of motto was never ask for money, never ask for, for help in such a way, but just to pray to God, just to pray to God to provide for their table. So he had uh, one instance, we have the, uh, that's it. On, on one instance, he had 300 children in the house there, in, in the building that they purchased, to 300 children to feed, and he had no food. And, and so he got them all together, and there was uh, time for, for, for the, their meal, and he said, okay, let's, let's pray, let's say the grace. And so they said the grace, and there was a knock at the door. And uh, when, when he opened the door, it was a local baker. And he said that I was moved at 2 a.m. this morning by God, and I was, it, was, it, it was pressed upon me that I should make more bread than I normally do and bring it here. And so this baker had brought all this bread for, for him. And then not only just after that, there was, um, he, he was just, they were getting into their meal, and there was another knock on the door. There was a um, there was a knock from the milkman who said his wagon had, bro had broken down just outside, and could they take all the milk that um, that, that he had in his wagon into into their into into, into, that, into the orphanage, just by praying that here that this man George Muller found that God met his needs day after day after day. He didn't put out an appeal letter. And it's an incredible story of, of um, George Muller, because at the end of his life, he, he's somebody who had, who had exact accounts of everything that he did. And, it's, and he had written down that he had 1.5 million pounds in his, in his time through his ministry, through his accounts, 1.5 million pounds. And all of that was by prayer just by praying to God to provide for them. And that 1.5 billion pounds in our day is 100 million pounds. This is a mass kind of, you know, global kind, um, kind of organization. God provided just by his faith, just by operating in that realm. And this, this is words that he said, faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. So it's not about our power. Where man's power ends is where faith begins. And let's pray. A prayer from the words of Augustine. Trust in the past to God's mercy the present to God's love, and the future to God's providence. Amen. Amen. I believe in God, the Father the Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. 
On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come and judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, the Most Holy Lord, we thank you for this blessed day. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have provided us with your only Son, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, we once again, as Christ Church, we thank you for that you have bled and given your life on the cross of Calvary so that we could live. Lord Holy Spirit, our Counselor, we thank you for your counsel and your comfort and your guidance. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for all the provision, the guidance and all the safety that you have given us, Lord, the peace that you have given us, Lord. Lord, as Christ Church, we come to thy prayer presence. We pray for our country, England, Lord. Lord, we pray that there will be peace. May the Prince of Peace maintain the peace in our country, Lord. Lord, as the whole world is going through an uncertain situation, recession, famine, natural disasters, but we look upon to you, Lord, for heavenly favor, the divine grace, so that you could, we could maintain, we could live in peace in our country. Lord, we pray that you would give wisdom to our Prime Minister, the good health, and also to his officials, so they could leave the, leave the state in the right way and according to thy will. We also pray for the royal family, that you would continue to protect them, guide them, bless them, and keep them as a blessing to our state. Lord, we hear the new virus again. There's two confirmed cases of monkeypox, a viral infection in London. Lord, we pray that you would contend and you would stop and you would stop any viral infections or any disease, new disease or any other form of COVID into this country, Lord. We ask for your divine protection that you will cover the whole country with the blood of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we also ask for healing for the country, whoever is in sick bed, Lord. Lord, we hear the news is that Putin has warned Finland for joining into NATO. Lord, we do not want another war. Lord, as the world is going into the greedy and capturing into the other country, interfering into other countries. Lord, we do not want a situation like Ukraine again, even in this Finland. Lord, we remember, Lord, for the people, almost like more than 30 people had been killed in New Delhi in a fire accident in a complex. Lord, we pray that our Lord Holy Spirit would comfort the people who had lost their loved ones. Lord, we pray for Ukraine. With a burdened heart, we pray that you would bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Our Heavenly Father, your Father of mercy and grace, Lord, hundreds of people have been killed and thousands of fleeing for their life, Lord. Lord, we see in the news that thousands of people are hiding in hideouts without proper food, without basic needs, and thousands have lost their belongings, their houses, and their running as refugees into other countries. It is so painful to see them, Lord. 
when they go as refugees to other country, leaving the country, leaving their belongings, leaving their loved ones, they run. Lord, such a painful agony. Lord, we pray that you bring an end to the war and bring peace in your brain. Merciful Father, again, a disaster has happened where more than 10 people have been killed. In New York, around in the supermarket, somebody has opened fire and 10 people have been killed. Lord, we pray that you are the Prince of Peace. You have shed your blood for each and every one of us in the whole world. Lord. Bring peace. People so the people may live in peace and they do not fear. Lord, now we come to our Church of England. We send all the bishops and all the officials that you would continue to bless them with strength, knowledge, wisdom and skills so they could run the organization according to thy will and let many people be brought to Jesus Christ and let them receive salvation. Now we come and pray for our Christ Church West Croydon. Lord we pray for our wicker Lord bless him, give him good health, good strength wisdom and knowledge so that he could serve you and the church in the full capacity. Lord, we pray for the annual church meeting which is on the 22nd of May. We pray for all the people who are participating in the meeting and especially who stand for the PCC members, church wardens, all the officials who are to be appointed. Let your will be done. And then anybody who is volunteering and who is going to be elected, Lord, let them serve, Lord, in full capacity so they could be more useful to thy kingdom, Lord, and to the community and to Christ Jesus, Lord. Lord, we pray for Vivia once again. Lord, Holy Spirit, strengthen her as she is grieving for the loss of her sister. We pray for Mark, Richard, Winsome, and others who need strength and healing. Lord, please, once again, we thank you for all the grace and mercy. We thank you for all your life. We thank you for all the blessings and protection. We continue that your will be done. We send once again, send us whole Christ Church was spread to thy feet. Let us be blessed abundantly and let us be a blessing to thy kingdom, to the community and to the country. All these things we ask in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ.
Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And a prayer of thanksgiving.
one stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God our Saviour through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory majesty dominion and authority before all time and now and forever Amen. Amen. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.